very much, Matthew. It's a pleasure to be here in Sydney. Now, I know the rivalry between Sydney and Melbourne is very intense, but having three seasons in two days is just, you know, going a little bit over the top. <laughs> um, so, uh, I now live on the Gold Coast, uh, which is, uh, as indicated on the slide, uh, not all fun and games now. We uh, do have that fabulous beach and the theme parks, but down the bottom there on the right is the new Gold Coast University Hospital, uh, which is a $1.8 billion facility which has just been completed. And next to it, although our medical school at Griffith is only 10 years old, we now have our second brand new medical school building, which is the building on the left of the bottom. Uh, so I'm living in a very privileged environment, and I'm going to talk to you about current and emerging treatments for uh, MS. And really, we've got a fabulous setup on the Gold Coast as and we have in many places around Australia to both provide good service and provide ongoing research into a whole host of conditions, but obviously my main area of interest is MS. So I'm going to talk very briefly about our current concepts of what MS is, and that's always difficult because it is changing very quickly at the moment. Uh, a treatment timeline to sort of show what the rate of change and progress has been. If I'd been giving this talk 20 years ago, it would have been a very short talk. Um, and now I'm going to be struggling to get it in within the allotted 20 minutes. Uh, talk a bit about established therapies and then some of the emerging therapies. Uh, and then a bit about what our guiding principles are because it's becoming more difficult as neurologists treating uh, people with MS uh, just in terms of the range of choice that we now have. A little bit about symptomatic treatment and then the future prospects. Well, a lot of that you'll have already heard about from Lisa this morning uh, because the last two days we've really heard a lot of uh, promising uh, areas of further research over the last two days. So our current concepts of MS are we've known about the pathology of MS for 150 years. Um, the key features are these areas of demyelination as indicated by the green and the red arrows in the pathology slide at the top left. Um, for a long time we were really struggling to answer the question of what is the cause of MS. And of course it's ended up being very complicated. There isn't a cause of MS. There's a whole host of risk factors for developing MS, but we've probably now explained about 80 or 90 percent of the causation of MS. And those things are the EV virus, which is that black on that photo on the left there, uh, vitamin D and relative lack of sunshine, uh, both independently um, increase your risk of MS. Smoking increases your risk of MS. And then finally, having a genetic predisposition, so your genetic background. MS is not a, an hereditary disease as such, uh, but there is a slightly increased risk amongst first degree relatives of someone who has MS uh, above the background population. And we now know, we've now found at least 110 <coughs> genes that are definitely associated with MS, and there are probably a lot more to come. Um, we've undertaken a, a family analysis recently which estimates there may be as many as 1,500. The genetics data points to maybe being 350, but there's a lot more to come probably. Um, so that's why people get MS in the first place. But then what is MS? It's an inflammatory disease of the nervous system. We hear that all of, all of the time. Uh, but I guess recently we've become aware that there are two processes going on. One is an inflammatory process as illustrated by this slide down the bottom. We can see that on the pathology and we can see it on MRI scans as white dots um, of inflammation in the white matter predominantly and these represent clinically as relapses on this schematic diagram here. So that's what people experience in terms of symptoms early on and it's usually this relaxed remitting form. Later on, a more progressive and degenerative process leading to atrophy in the brain and increasing levels of disability, unfortunately, tends to become the predominant feature. And there's clearly a relationship between the two. The more of this inflammatory phase you have at the beginning, the more likely you are to get this progressive phase later on. It's not universal that you develop this element of the disease, but it is very common. And so therefore, if you don't treat MS over a 20 to 30 or even 40 year time span, the chances are it will affect people quite significantly. So the good news is we now have a whole host of treatments that have come along. In, since about the 1950s, we've had some acute treatments that have worked for the acute relapses, um, and mainly some form of steroid, essentially. And then we've had symptomatic <coughs> treatments that have helped with the stiffness and bladder symptoms and depression that you can get in MS um, for about a similar period of time, 60 years or so. Uh, 
But then when it comes to actual disease-modifying therapies, in about the 1980s, azathioprine started to become recognized as a useful treatment. But it does have some significant problems, as I'll discuss briefly in a minute. And really, it was during the 90s that the beta interferon and Capaxone became available. And this was really the first uh, real inroad into sort of having a, an effective treatment for MS. We've had the option of bone marrow transplant since the late 90s. And uh, that's when people started using it for MS. And I'll talk more about that again. And it's still sort of a, a potential option at the moment. Mitisantrone met with great excitement because it appeared to be the first treatment that we have for MS that works for very active and even progressive forms of MS. Um, but again, there are some issues and problems with that drug that mean it's probably not going to meet with widespread use now. And then really, it's over the last 10, 15 years, we've had this emergence of a whole raft of new, more effective treatments, um, which I think are going to really change the landscape in terms of how we manage and how people um, have to live with their MS in the future. And then there are more, more drugs coming out. I've only got a couple of them listed here, but there are many, many more being tested. So it really has, you know, as I say, in the last 20 years gone from really limited options through to now having a range of about nine approved therapies in Australia. So how do we know about, or what do we know about how these drugs work? And it's amazing how much um, things are all tying together. We've worked out what the sort of pathology and mechanism pathogenesis of MS is through animal models, uh, working humans and also from the genetics now. Um, and so we've built up this picture, and I won't go through the detail of this, this is just illustrative, but basically there's an inflammation process that begins in lymph nodes in the, in the body, leads to activated inflammatory cells moving into the brain and then causing damage by a variety of mechanisms. And we have found drugs that act on that process at various levels. We have um, fingolimod, which is a new treatment that's been around for a couple of years, which basically blocks the cells ever getting out of the lymph node. We have natalizumab, which is a very effective treatment, which stops the lymphocytes getting into the brain. It simply blocks them passaging into the brain. We have treatments like beta interferon, glutamate acetate, which seem to just down-regulate the inflammation. Uh, we have newer drugs like BG12 or dimethyl fumarate, which seems to act at stabilizing all cells, but particularly maybe oligodendrocytes, the nerves that produce, or the cells that produce the myelin in the brain, and seems to make them more uh, resilient. It basically makes them less uh, susceptible to uh, toxins, such as nitrous oxide. So it, the whole picture is now starting to fit together. And I guess the main thing to emphasize is, although the 110 genes that we seem to have found in MS is in a way a little bit meaningless because there's just so much there's not one target we can sort of aim at. It now tells us where to go looking for potential therapeutic targets. We know these genes are involved and they are important in MS. So I think we'll see more and more advancement in the next few years. So going back to the original immunosuppressive therapies, azathioprine, it definitely works for MS. It reduces relapses by about 23%. Although the data collected back then was not as uh, kind of comparable with modern day data, it probably did reduce disability over time. And it certainly reduced MRI lesions. The problems are that if you take this drug for more than five years, you get a two-fold increase in the risk of cancers, a whole range of different cancers. And also there are problems with risks of opportunistic infections, as with all immunosuppressant drugs. So it's not a long-term option. Occasionally we still do use it when, when really there is nothing else but probably we'll see less and less of this. Mitosantrone, as I said, it appeared to be very useful for secondary progressive MS. And I think still in some cases where you've got people going, uh, you know, getting worse before your eyes and everything else has failed, it may still be an option. But there's about a 2% risk of getting cardiac failure, even at the recommended dosage. And there's a risk of leukemia as well. So again, it's not going to be a treatment for everyone. So, Beta interferon and Capaxone have been around now for 20 years. There's again, no doubt, they basically all are very similar. They reduce the chance of relapses by about a third. Um, and although it's been difficult to prove their effect in terms of disability, 
Um, we now know that they, in the long term, I'll show a slide at the end, that they do have that effect. Um, and so the other key thing about these, although they have the nuisance of all being delivered via an injection, they are all very safe. After 20 years, there is nothing that has emerged as a safety concern. Uh, so although they're only marginally effective, they are effective, they're very safe, and a lot of people, they're still going to be the ideal option, I think. Um, and certainly, if, if you're on these treatments and they seem to be working, then the best thing to do is just stick with them. We know that they also work in early MS, so if you've just had one attack that looks like it's going to be part of MS, then if you uh, start on these treatments early, they prevent your chance of ever, or reduce your risk of ever having another attack and therefore de developing definite MS. Similarly, <coughs> even in progressive forms of MS, they actually have an effect on the number of relapses that you have. So whilst they probably don't have a big impact on whether or not you're going to get worse over time, they do have a, an effect on the number of relapses, so they do significantly reduce that, which is of, of benefit. And similarly, even in progressive MS, although, again, they don't have much effect on the rate of progression over the two years of the studies, or three years of the studies in this case, but they do reduce the number of lesions, and one would predict that over time that would have an effect on disability, but no one's ever run a study for the 10 years you probably need to demonstrate, unfortunately. So then we come to nasalizumab, which was the first of the new generation of drugs that we have, which has a much more dramatic effect. So it reduces the risk of relapses by almost 70%. So twice as effective as leader interferon. And again, it's the first drug that really showed that you could reduce levels of disability over even just a two year time frame of the study. Um, so there's no doubt that this drug is very effective. And um, so why isn't everybody on natalizumab? One small problem, which is this thing, which could be mistaken for MS, but this is actually a thing called PML, or progressive multifocal lip encephalopathy, which is a, uh, an encephalitis caused by a virus known as the JC virus, just after the initials of the first person who ever was described as having this uh, particular condition. <coughs> now, this virus is carried by about 50% of the population. It normally doesn't cause any problem, it lives in kidneys quite happily doesn't cause any disease at all that we know of. But if you are immunosuppressed for any reason, so generally immunosuppressed as in chemotherapy for cancer, there is a risk of developing this. It's still a very low risk. Uh, but similarly, if you block the white cells that normally traffic through the brain and protect your brain from this kind of infection, as in treatment with natalizumab, then unfortunately you run a risk of developing this. So the overall risk of developing PML was quoted originally as about one in a thousand, but we can now actually test people to see whether they have the virus. And if you don't have the virus, your risk of developing PML has been found to be so far estimated at one in 10,000. So, and it may well prove to be even lower. So essentially a very low risk. So if you don't have the virus, you can take this drug with a, with a very low chance of ever developing any problem. If you do have the virus, unfortunately, after about four to six years of being on treatment, your risk of developing PML is about six in a thousand, so it's actually becoming quite likely. So I think if you do have the virus, long-term use of this drug is probably not an option. It does look as though the risk, we did think it might tail off after the first couple of years, but it does look as though the risk is sort of becoming fairly persistent over time. So whilst your risk in the first sort of two to three years is relatively low, and so rising after that time, it looks as though the risk per year is just going to stay about the same. And that probably makes sense in terms of what we know about this virus. So moving to fingolimod, which is the first oral treatment uh, that we've had for MS. Uh, natalizumab, natalizumab is an infusion you have once a month. Fingolimod is a tablet that you take once a day, very convenient, and it is also very effective. It reduces um, relapses by about 50% essentially, not quite as effective as Tysabri or Natalizumab, but it's certainly more effective than the beta interferons and so Similarly, it also has an effect on uh, disability and MRI activity. It does have a few issues, it slows your heart rate with the first dose, and it can cause this thing, rarely cause this thing called macroedema, but no one's ever had their vision affected by this. There's a swelling at the back of the eye. 
And it does reduce your lymphocyte count in the blood, but not significantly, and there's no associated risk of infection. So it's now been approved by the TPA for about the last year and a half, and it's listed on the PPS. Uh, next, the oral treatment of teriflunamide. Uh, basically, it's about as effective as the beta interferons, and it does have some adverse effects, which I think are going to limit uh, how much we use this drug. But again, it's great to have another alternative where either everything else is not appropriate or where people just can't tolerate the thought of taking injections. Dimethylfumarate is going to be approved for the PBS in, as of the 1st of December this year. And again, this is basically it's another oral treatment taken twice a day. It's about as effective as Fingolimod. Uh, as it reduces relapses by about 50% and again it has a significant effect on the chance of developing disability. Um, again it's associated with some sort of side effects which are transient and relatively trivial and they basically all resolve usually within about three months. Uh, but for about 10% of people they're very troublesome and a bit more persistent and they're not going to be able to take this long term. But for everyone else, once they get over that phase, it seems to be very well tolerated and very safe. It's been around uh, in Germany for the treatment of psoriasis for about 40 years. Uh, so we're reasonably confident this is going to be a long-term safe option. And then alentuzumab. Uh, this is uh, no Mickey Mouse treatment. This is a monoclonal antibody that basically des destroys all of your circulating lymphocytes, the white cells that fight infection. It sounds very dramatic because it really eradicates them all temporarily. Your bone marrow then repopulates the system over about three to four months, and by about a year, your levels are about 70 to 80% back to normal. Uh, but it reduces relapses, and this is a comparison against beta interferons. This is not a comparison against placebo. It's an active treatment which we know works, and it improves the uh, risk of relapses by about 50% against that active treatment. So this is very effective, and again, similarly, it reduces the chances of getting disability. Um, so it's a very effective treatment, it's a very appealing treatment, it's given as a course of infusions for five days at the beginning, three more infusions a year later, and basically for about 80% of people over 10 years, that's all they'll ever need. So it's a very, very effective treatment. There are some problems with it. Um, uh, there is a bit of a risk of infection, particularly in that first few months. Most of them are trivial and no one's died from those. You also have a very marked chance of getting thyroid disease, which in women is about 30 or 40 percent. Now that's all treatable, uh, and certainly my experience has been people are much more happy to have thyroid disease than they are to have MS. Uh, there is a low risk of a thing called uh, immune thrombocytopenia, uh, not purpura, uh, thrombocytopenia, sorry, and uh, also good passenger syndrome, which is where autoimmune disease affecting the kidneys and the lungs, which can be life-threatening, but in this case, because people are monitored for this very carefully, um, it can be treated early, and again, it proves to be very treatable. So again, I don't think it's going to be a drug for everyone, but it's great to have these potent treatments <coughs> available to us, and it's now TGA approved, and hopefully we'll be listed on the PBS in the next 12 months or so. Again, there's some more treatments coming, laquinamide and ticlizumab. I won't talk too much about these, but these will probably be available in the next couple of years. And ocrelizumab is a very interesting drug. This basically is very similar to alentuzumab, but instead of targeting all of the white cells in the blood, it only targets B cells. And again, it seems to be very effective. We didn't originally think B cells were very important in MS, uh, but we now know that they are. And they probably have a regulatory function. So, It'll be interesting to see what emerges from this treatment. Again, it does have some problems associated with it, but it uh, certainly seems to be very effective. I know a lot of people ask me about stem cell therapy, and there are lots of different forms of stem cell therapy, but the most widely used at the moment is some form of bone marrow transplantation. So taking your own blood cells to create stem cells, er eradicating the cells from your bone marrow, and then reinfusing your own stem cells to repopulate that bone marrow. Um, it appears to be very effective in these cohorts, which were largely people with MS who had very severe disease. Um, you're preventing further progression in 70 to 80%. So that is looking to be very effective. There is a problem though, the chance of dying from the procedure alone 
in the big measure houses that's been done is 2.7%. So in this population that this has been offered, that's probably reasonable because your actual chance of dying from the ORMS if you have that very bad form of the disease is a similar sort of level. So in general, MS doesn't affect your long-term survivability, but if you've got the bad form, it can do. So Australia set up a national registry. I think we've got about 21 cases now. Uh, there have been no deaths, fortunately. Um, and it would be fair to say that most people who've had this have improved, some dramatically, some marginally. Uh, but I think it will take further work, both on improving the safety of this approach, uh, but also on how we select the people for whom are going to benefit from this kind of rapid treatment. Uh, so that's a quick comparison of all the drugs that we currently have available that are approved in Australia. And basically ranges from the drugs like beer interferon, lateral acetate, which is capaxone, and terraflunamide, across to natalizumab and alantuzumab, which are more effective on all of these measures of disability. Um, the MRI appearances, and now even brain atrophy, we can actually measure change even over two years. Um, so it's proving effective. Um, as I say, the beauty of the drugs that are injectable and simple are that they're very, very safe. They have a number of side effects, but they're relatively trivial. These more effective treatments have got some fairly rare but fairly significant potential side effects that we're going to have to learn to manage. I'll skip over that. In terms of the long-term outcome, thanks to the MS Space um, Collaboration, which is run by Helmut Verskuven in Melbourne, so this is collecting data on thousands and thousands of patients from all over the world. Um, and I nicked this off his poster from this meeting this, this last two days, hence it's a slightly funny, shaky camera photo. Um, uh, but basically, this is looking at the long-term outcomes. So this is your chance of developing further progression. Um, so at the beginning, obviously, there's no one progressing over time, more people start to progress. This blue line is if you are on no treatment. I can't remember what the colours are, but these are basically forms of beta interferon and capaxone. So they are those relatively modestly effective treatments. But over time, they reduce your risk of developing more severe disability. Uh, so this is over an eight year time span. So this, is, this shows what sort of length of time you have to wait for before the effects are seen. But there's no doubt these drugs are having a definite effect. And one would assume that the more effective new treatments that we have will even be more dramatic on this kind of measure. So life is going to become more difficult. We're going to have to take into account kind of patient preferences. I think uh, this little graph down here shows us that um, people with MS are actually uh, less concerned about risks of treatment. They're more concerned about how effective the treatment is, which is understandable. So, Neurologists tend to be more conservative, so we need to learn to understand your fears and um, those people with MS fears um, a little bit better. Uh, but also convenience and lifestyle will have an impact on what treatments you have. Um, how easy it is to give the treatment. Offering um, bone marrow transplantation services is not a minor undertaking for health services to offer. It has a whole lot of implications. Um, and then also, I think we'll learn more and more over time about actual individual factors. Um, and I think, in particular, increasingly in the future, genetics is going to become important. Uh, symptomatic treatment, we have now got a few treatments for stiffness and spasm in baclofen and nabiximols. Uh, it will be interesting to see how effective this is. This is effective in cannabis. Um, it's a specific extract from cannabis, um, but in one of the three trials that have been done, it did show an effect on spasm and uh, stiffness. We've got some very good treatments for bladder symptoms. Uh, the oxybutin in patch is proving to be very effective with fewer side effects, and Botox um, uh, into the bladder is, is really proving to be very effective for those who are badly affected. And I won't talk too much about mobility and pain, so I think I'm running out of time. So where are we going in the future? I think uh, we're getting more and more traction in looking at treatments for progressive MS. Uh, you'll have heard Lisa talking about the innate immune system and macrophages and how we're looking at treatments that are going to affect the progressive stage of MS. So there are currently two phase three trials running in progressive forms of MS. 
and there are multiple phase one and two studies, some of which are being undertaken here in Australia. Um, and we've got these new targets that have been identified by the genetics. And I think increasingly we'll move towards specific uh, treatment for individuals. And ultimately we have the goal of actual preventive treatments. And I think the possible emergence of uh, EBV vaccines and the like may offer some hope there. So, in conclusion, untreated MS is a bad disease for the vast majority. Early treatment is very important and the treatments are effective. But those decisions about what treatment is going to be right for each individual is becoming more complicated and uh, we're going to have to wrestle with that. Uh, I think the key is to balance the risks against how effective they are and what the individual factors are. Thank you very much for your attention.